Right. Uh, good morning. Success, Divya. Good morning. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, I'll, I'll pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this new week that you've given us, Lord. And uh, even as we just sit in your presence to pray and to read your word and to study from your word, oh God, I pray that, Holy Spirit, you will speak to us, you will minister to us, Lord, that everything that we study, Lord, will be used for your glory, oh God. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we've been doing... Uh, the book timeless principles for the workplace and uh, we have completed section one which talks about uh so uh, there were three chapters in section one completed them so last week we talked about you know right workplace attitudes and uh, you know how we need to maintain integrity truthfulness work hard uh, god does not like uh, laziness. Uh, another important point we discussed was on, uh, uh, you know, the time that God has given us. How we use our time. Uh, never stop learning. So keep learning, keep growing. Um, and also, when the unexpected uh, happens, stay calm, stay focused. Uh, continue to pursue what God has for you. Right. So that is section one. Let's go to section two. Now we're going to move from our personal things uh you know right workplace attitudes all of that and we're going to move into corporate vision mission values and culture right now even as you know maybe some of us are working for an organization or uh maybe we have our own business that's wonderful uh, or even if you're working with a church right um uh, it is not just that we grow uh you know in our in our areas of uh you know, work that is given to us, not just growth in uh, pay or not, uh, all that is important, but what we must also do is to uh, really believe in the mission, the vision of the organization, embracing its values, right? Uh, embracing the culture that is, uh, that is, you know, in the organization. Now, let's just look at a few points here, right? The corporate vision describes what you wish to become as an organization right so for example right if you are uh, uh, like any organization it does not have to be a you know, big multi-million dollar organization it could be something very small a small scale organization but it is very important to have a vision right because that's where you want to see the organization right that's where you want to see uh, uh, you wish the organization to become this way right so if you look at the uh, example, right, All People's Church, uh, we had a vision to be the salt and light in the city of Bangalore, voice to the nation and to the nations. Or even when we started in 2001, there were eight people, right? So uh, it's not like, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the vision is there. It's not like we're going to achieve that vision in one year or two years. No, right? it, it takes time for that vision. But as... Uh, as an entrepreneur or as a leader, you must always envision what you want to see your organization or whatever role that you're uh, leading, uh, where do you want to see it? Right? So for example, if you're uh, a team leader, right, you may not be the CEO of an organization, but maybe you're a team leader, but where do you want to see your team? You know, two years from now, right? Uh, of course, there's a corporate vision, but then you instill that vision in your team as well, right? The mission describes how you're going to do things, right, to accomplish that vision. Right? Now, mission is very important because we can use, uh, you know, wrong methods to, you know, to reach a target. But the mission is, again, describes how you're going to do achieve what you have in mind, the vision. And three is the values. So the standards of the organization, right? For example, as an organization, we believe that men and women should be treated equally. Uh, men and women should have equal pay, equal opportunities. Uh, we also, in an organization, we also have certain percentage of, uh, you know, uh, for people who are 
disabled, maybe blind, people who are physically disabled, uh, and if they have the skills, we give them opportunities. So these are certain values that uh, organizations have, right? And then is the culture. The culture is the intangible component, right? Uh, the work environment, uh, how people work together. Now, culture is very important, right? Uh, if you look at uh, an organization, so for example, if somebody is comes to your company, a friend of yours, and they just walk around in, in the office, most probably they will get an idea of what the culture of the organization is right now. Okay, may not be the first time, but maybe if they come a couple of times, look around in the office, hey, okay, this is what uh, it looks like everyone worked together. It looks like, you know, um, even the bosses, you know, working together. Uh, you know, recently somebody sent me a picture of this, right? Uh, uh, the CEO of Facebook uh, and his desk. Right, it was it was really nice to see that he has. I'm not sure if you've seen that, but he has a, you know, he has a desk. He doesn't have his own cabin, so it's just a desk, with, you know, with his papers and all of it, and it's with the regular employees around, right? So it's not like there's a separate place. Okay, I'm the boss. Or so that's really nice to see that, right? It it just adds so much value. Uh, it's not like you're separating yourself, saying, hey, I'm a multi-millionaire, I'm the CEO, and you are working for me. No. Right? He was there. And, and these are cultures that we can, uh, you know, uh, start, or, or uh, it's a culture that we create in an organization. Right? So many times, uh, you know, there are work benefits, right? So all that is good. But we can have work benefits, but a very uh, wrong culture or a uh, you know a culture in the workplace may not be very ethical. Right? But the benefits are wonderful. So we must have a balance of all of this, right? So let's look at a few points here, right? Uh, your vision influences your productivity. Right? Proverbs twenty nine eighteen, where there is no revelation. Uh, very, very common verse, or where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. Uh, the word revelation is an inspired dream or a vision, right? So where there is no inspired dream or vision, there is nothing that compels us to do anything. Right? It's like just wandering about aimlessly, and we end up in unproductive. But a compelling vision captures the imagination. It, it grips people's hearts. It fires up passion. It, it inspires action. It, it just stirs us to do something. Like it creates focus. It creates, it births ideas. It, it influences our thoughts. It guides decisions, provides direction. It, it's wonderful. Right? And all of this is a result of productive organization. Right now, very important to have a vision. Now, the vision could be very big. Right, uh, right now, we may be a small organization, a small church, a small ministry. Uh, but you must have this, have a vision, right? Because your vision will influence the productivity, your productivity. The productive productivity of your team, eventually, eventually the productivity of the organization. Right? Uh, now, a vision could be one or two sentences. It can be maximum three. So it shouldn't be like a whole, you know, paragraph. It's just something that will stir us all. Right? It's something that can, you know, uh, very descriptive. So when you see the vision, you know, okay, this is what we want to achieve. Uh, for example, the Bible College, our vision is to equip believers for the work of the ministry. Very simple. And we don't want to uh, equip believers to, you know, just uh, or to become famous. It's not our, our vision is not okay. Just so that we have hundreds of people join and then 
you know, we everyone knows about APC. No, it's not that. We want every believer to be equipped to do the work of the ministry, right? And so where you do the work of the ministry, it's up to you, right? We, as we know, like, you know, many of us are from different countries, but we feel, you know, just by doing this, hey, we are fulfilling the vision. What drives us? Yeah, we are fulfilling the vision or to equip every believer for the work of the ministry. Right? And so have these vision statements. Uh, let it, you know, of course, you know, fire always tries to die off, but we need to fan it. We need to, you know, uh, just stir it up every now and then. Right? Uh, you know, I, uh, it could be even for your personal things. Uh, I've written here the example here and I've shared with John many times. Uh, John is right now in Bangalore uh, looking at the, th the church there. Uh, and it's wonderful because when when we went there, uh, you know, it was, it was a difficult time, uh, uh, but it was also a very encouraging time. So I just knew that, okay, God is going to do something. Uh, but, you know, there was this feeling of, Okay, I have to push on. I have to press on. I have to do something to see this church, to see the congregation being built up. And of course, we had a wonderful team. Right? We were maybe about five of us, five, six of us on the team. And, you know, as a team, we did so much. Uh, we just went out, we went out of our way. And many of them in, our, in the team were uh, you know, elderly people. Right? They're all above. 55, 60 years old, and they would come out with me on outreaches. And uh, so it was so wonderful because what happens is when you you have a vision, you keep sharing it, people catch that vision. Uh, it's like a fire, no, it spreads. So people would say, okay, you know, Master, we'll come along with you wherever you're going. I don't force them. But they started coming. And then as a team, we started going to different places, reaching out. Our, your vision will influence your productivity, right? Second point, your vision, you will write it, repeat it, repeat it, keep repeating it. Go back to your vision, read it. Look at Habakkuk 2 and verse 3 and 4. And the Lord answered and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak. And it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. What a powerful verse. Habakkuk is saying, write your vision, make it known in tablets. Right? Write it down. Right? If, we, if we have a vision, don't keep it here and say, okay, the vision is here. No, write it down. Right? Uh, because visions can easily be forgotten. New things may come up, right? Uh, now, this can be a corporate vision, personal vision, ministry vision. Write it down. Right? Uh, so, for example, this is an example, right? You want to start a church, you know, uh, and your, your vision is to start your own ministry. Now, you feel, okay, this year, 2023, you want to start by doing all the paperwork and Maybe by, towards the end of the year, start the ministry. Now, you must firstly have the vision. What is the vision of the church? Have it in writing. What is the mission? Have it in writing. What is what is it that you want to achieve? Uh, what are the teams? That what is the culture? Right. So you're writing them all down, and every time you look at it, you pray about it. And you say, hey, one day I am going to, uh, you know, as a church, we'll be able to impact at least 10,000 people in my city. Right? And so that's the vision. Uh, so right now it's nothing. It's only on paper. Right? There's not even a place. You haven't even selected, maybe you haven't even selected a place to start the church. Right? But the vision is there. Right? Keep constantly reminding yourself of that vision keep motivated keep keep being propelled into action right uh, uh, continuous repetition of a vision 
excites people. And when you keep doing that, the dream begins to take shape. Right? Uh, if some of you have been called to be preachers and pastors, uh, picture yourself, write it down. One day I will preach. Uh, you know, I begin to start preaching. One day I begin to start teaching the word of God. This is how I will do it. Uh, if you want, you know, you plan to start a Bible college. Okay, this is how I want to start the Bible college. This is how I will intake students. This is what these are the subjects that I will teach. No harm uh, in writing them down. Right? Uh, nothing wrong with it because it's just going to fuel you up. It's going to propel you to action. Right? Because what happens is, say for example, you plan to start a Bible college, and then uh, two years is over, and then it's your time. You're going to start now. Everything is done. You've got the place. You've hired a place. You have the. Oh, what do I teach? What are the subjects for the two-year course? Okay, what do I teach? I don't know. And then no. So you're prepared. Vishen say, okay, these. If I start my Bible college, I'm going to start with these courses. These are the uh, you know courses I'm going to teach first year, second year. Uh, these are the outreach ministries we will do. And this is how the college will run. This is the vision, mission. Everything is down on paper. So you're not surprised. You know, uh, it's not like, okay, what do I do now? Now that the college has started, right? Very important in, in terms of vision is also, remember that we cannot work alone. We talked about it uh, last time also, last class, few classes. We cannot work alone. You know, the Lord Jesus, being the Son of God, formed teams. And we must remember that in everything that we do, we must work as a team. The Lord Jesus set a beautiful example. He raised up 12 leaders, then he did 72. He worked in teams. So it's never a single one-man show. Right? Uh, it is your vision, but you need a team to fulfill that vision. Right? If you want people to keep running with the vision, you've got to keep repeating it again and again and again. I, I just want to encourage each one of us. You know, maybe some of us are very young. Some of us are in our, uh, in our thirties uh, or forties. Maybe there are visions that you know, or plans or things that we've had in our heart, but we put it away. Go back to it. Ask God. God, write it down. Ask God. God, is this something that I can do? Is this something that you will, you know, uh, open doors for me? Keep it open. Right. Uh, there's, uh, for God, you know, nothing is too late. Like He's still able to, uh, you know, fulfill the things that you have in your heart. But again, uh, there's a work that we must do, right? Uh, so just a bit of an encouragement there. A compromised vision. Next point. A compromised vision leaves people confused. Look at this. Matthew six, <clears throat> twenty-two and twenty-three. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, the whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, the whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Right. So a blurred vision will keep people in darkness. It's like this. You know, I always picture it this way. You're leading a group of people. And you know they're walking behind you, and suddenly you enter. They, you enter a tunnel. What happens? There's darkness ahead. Now, being a leader, I may not know what to do, where to go. So how can I lead the people behind me when I myself don't know what I'm doing? Like, right? as as you know, if we are leading people. That vision should be strong in us so that the others following behind us don't go into a wrong direction. And you know, if the leader falls, remember the whole team goes. Right? So when we don't have a vision, productivity drops, the organization is affected, and and it, it needs to be clarified immediately. Right? So just have that vision. Don't have a compromised vision, right? Next one. State your mission loud and clear. Uh, I'm just going to go a little bit quick because we have a lot to cover. 
Uh, but if you have any questions, as usual, you can stop me. You can ask questions uh, in between, right? So please stop me if you have questions. <clears throat> right, state your mission loud and clear. Luke 4, 18 and 19. Look at this, uh, wonderful. Jesus comes in, he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Uh, he's beginning his ministry. He says, because he has chosen me to bring the good news to the poor. Vision. He set me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recover sight to the blind. To set, to set free the oppressed and announce that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. Okay, Divya has a question. What is the difference between a God-given promise conveyed through a godly vision and a general vision? Okay, so a God-given vision or a God-given promise is usually very targeted. So for example, the, uh, see, there is a general vision for all of us. Right? What is the general vision? Hey, uh, you know, I grow up, I finish my studies and, you know, get a job, um, you know, Join the workplace, get married, have children, raise up children, and you know that's that's a general vision. Now God is not going to say I'm, uh, you know, He's not going to come and say, you uh, know, I'm going to get you married and you'll have two children. You have to look after that children. It is obvious that if God is giving us children, we have to look after it, uh, and we have to nurture them. We have to take care of them. A general vision, but. God will put something in your heart, in, you know, in our hearts, which will burn so passionately that it will not let us rest. Right? And later we'll talk about even uh, how, uh, you know, Nehemiah was able to build those walls in Jerusalem. Right? And that's a God-given vision. Uh, look at the Apostle Paul. That's a God-given vision. Right? It's going to it will burn in our hearts. It, it, it just You just know that this is God and God is going to do it. So what happens outside will not matter. And we'll be so focused on, we know that, okay, it's God who's doing it. Right? Uh, uh, look at, look at uh, uh, you know, uh, people in the Old Testament. Uh, they knew that, you know, the prophets, Elijah, Daniel, they all knew that this is God who's telling them, right? So they were to answer your question, a God-given promise or, or a God-given vision is, is it's something that will burn in your heart, right? It, it's just going to, it, it'll always be there, right? Uh, but a general vision is something that we all must do. And I hope I answered your question. I hope you got. You have. If you have any follow-up question, you can feel free to ask. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Paul. Uh, yes, I I understood. Uh, I was also trying to uh, get the difference between um, you know a promise of God, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, Abraham got a promise and it was conveyed through to him through a like look at the stars in the sky yeah. Yeah. or you know like something that's very visual a visual yeah. representation of the promise yeah. uh, maybe vision, vision is not a right word uh, yeah. sorry if I'm going a little off track here but um, I just yeah, wanted I... to know uh like there is uh, the, probably there is no action in that particular on the part of the man right mm -hmm. there is no particular action required uh it's just trusting the lord mm -hmm. uh, yeah. but but in in terms of a of a like a purpose like for an example as you said about nehemiah um, in that case he had to do something like he had to yes i was just trying to understand what is the difference between uh these two aspects like god gives us promises yeah. uh we have to maybe do some things out of those promises uh, like trusting god and you know yeah. making decisions based on that promise but what uh there could be like a life uh, vision or a purpose uh so it was just trying to understand what is the real difference between these yeah, that's a wonderful question, Libya. So uh, I'll begin by saying this, right? Now, whenever God gives a promise, right, it's always, it's, you know, nine out of 10 times, right? It's always God expects us to do something about it, 
right? So, for example, even Abraham. So, God told him, listen, uh, you come out, you look at the stars in the sky, I'm going to make your, uh, you know, your, you, the, the father of many, this is going to be the, your descendants. Now, of course, Abraham didn't have to do anything about it, but God made him wait 25 years for that. Right? Uh, there was this waiting time. There was this time where he had to go through, you know, waiting, trusting in the Lord, putting our faith. So promises are there, right? And it's always available. Uh, sometimes God makes us wait. So sometimes even if we don't have to do anything, in that process of waiting, uh, it's 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 only that you know God is making us stronger. We are building our faith. We are beginning to trust God even more. Um, you know, small things we begin to you know uh, uh, look to God even in our failures. We say, okay, God, because we hold on to those promises. Now these promises are for everyone, right? Um, so so if you look at it, Divya, I would say that. Uh, the the godly vision now sometimes you know so for example now with the holy spirit always inside us you know he can speak to us through the word he can give us a vision or a, a, a picture right uh, or he may he may sometimes reveal to us through a vision dream whatever however he like to, or he may just knowing it within us okay this is what um, you know god wants me to do Right. So if you look at it, whether it's a, a, a God-given promise, con, uh, you know, which is conveyed through a godly vision or a general vision, both ways, um, there is something that God makes us go through. Because you know, we know God, right? He, he, it's not always easy. He wants us to, he wants to teach us. He wants to instruct us. He wants us to trust in Him during those seasons. Right. So the promise and these visions and what God is giving us is wonderful. Uh, but for it to get fulfilled, it 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 takes time. It takes uh, you know, God may take us through different seasons for that. Right. Uh, and and as we wait, as we trust in him, you know, we are so much encouraged, we are so much built in our faith. Uh, you know, when I look back, I personally, uh, it's so encouraging. I say, God, I thank you for letting me go through these waiting times. Because if I had got something immediately, I wouldn't have uh, you know, respected it or wouldn't have valued it as much as I value it now. Right? So, uh, I hope that uh, answers your question, right? Uh, Yes, yes, perfectly. Uh, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Pastor Paul. Yeah, yeah, completely understand. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, great. All right. So state your mission loud and clear. The Lord Jesus, when he came, he didn't uh, he didn't say, uh, I've just come into, you know, just come here to Jerusalem. Uh, you know, he knew he's the son of God, but he didn't say, OK, I'll tell you later on who I am for now. Just come. Huh. He stated his mission very clearly. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Uh, talking from Isaiah, he has chosen me to bring the good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind. He is stating what he is going to do loud and clear. And he did this many a times. Before Abraham was, I am. You break, you destroy this temple, and in three, three days, it will you know it'll be it'll raise up again unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood you have no so there's no place where jesus is saying no uh, what if they kill me uh, so I, I'll, I'll just be very quiet here no he has stated his mission loud and clear uh, you know he's also telling his disciples you know you know one day uh, i'm going to go i'm not going to be here with you right he knew he knew from the beginning right uh, but he also knew what he can do, you know, what what uh, the disciples also will do. Look at this. The 12 disciples followed him and so did the crowds. Now, it, it became quite apparent that if you wanted to hear good news, if you wanted to experience liberty, wanted to receive sight, spiritual sight, physical sight, set free from oppression, then all you needed to do was go to Jesus. And it's so simple. 
Remember the Roman centurion, the Roman centurion. Why did they run to Jesus? Because they knew, hey, Jesus is one. He can do something. Right? Look at Jairus' daughter. Oh, you know, daughter's on. I can go to Jesus. I know that Jesus would do. Why? Because Jesus has already stated the mission before. The blind man Bartimaeus, what a wonderful, you know, so many people would have seen him there. But then when he heard Jesus was there, he said, I'm not going to let go. I've heard that he has healed blind people and he has cleansed the lepers. I'm going to go after him. The mission was clear. Right? He, he knew that people knew that if I come to Jesus, I will be delivered. And there are plenty of examples in the Bible, right? So, uh, I like those four men who carry their paralyzed friend and lower them from the ceiling. And just picture the faith of those four. Hey, you know what? You've been like this for so many years, but there's a man who says, if you come to me, I'll bring healing. I will, you know, he can heal. He has healed the blind. He has healed the lepers. Oh, but there's too much of crowd. How do we go there? No, don't worry. We'll do something. They open the ceiling and raise the Look at that. Right? So when we, you know, speak our vision out, state our mission out loud and clear, people will recognize it. People will recognize they recognize Jesus, right? Now, there were some people who, more than recognizing Jesus and the works that he did, they, they were looking at who he is and what he is, or where he is from. Look at the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Hey, this is Jesus. Isn't, his, isn't he the carpenter's son? And, uh, you know, his brother's here with us, his sister's also here with us. Mark chapter 3, I think. And we've seen him. He's been running around here from the time he's a young boy. But we've seen him. Now he's saying he's a Messiah. How is he doing all these things? Which school did he go and study? So they're doing all this research rather than looking at what he was doing. Right? But when you and I state your mission, state our mission, people will understand it. Tell it loud and clear. Look at John the Baptist. What did he do? John didn't say, I've come to, you know, uh, baptize everyone. No, no, no. What does he say? I have come to make way for the Lord. Very clear mission. Right? He didn't say, I've come to baptize people. Come, I'll baptize you. As one coming in the desert will prepare the way for the Lord. That's what the prophets wrote. That is me. This is what I'm doing. I'm preparing the way of the Lord. This is my mission. One day the Messiah will come whose feet, I'm, even whose sandals, I'm not worthy to touch. Right? The mission was loud and clear. Next, the values. Clarify what you stand for. For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? The sound of the trumpet was the call for battle. Right? It mobilized people to... Uh, enter into high risk engagement, calling them to fearless action. Now, if we don't have values, not only for an organization, not only for um, our personal, uh, for our ministry, not only for our families, not only for our personal lives, if we don't have values for all of this, we will break down. Because our values stand for who we are. Right? Uh, for example, one of the values that an APC that we follow is, uh, you know, um, transparency in financial matters. It's something that we've always done. Honesty, integrity, excellence, equality, dedication, pursue, uh, uh, you know, excellence, and just all these Christ-likeness, these values, right? So. So we want to do that, right? And what happens if we don't, you know, we don't have these values? We can do whatever we want to do. Nobody's there to question. Nobody's there to say anything. Nobody's there to say, don't do this, don't do that. Uh, because we haven't stated down our values. Right? So clarify what we stand for as an organization, as a ministry, as a, even in your personal life, have certain values. And we say this very loosely, hey, that person has a lot of values. He knows 
what do you think? Or this person has no values. You know, every time he changes his or her, whatever he's saying, right? We've used it before. Why? Because if we don't clarify what we stand for, um, not only people, but as an organization, um, they will not know what we are or who we are, right? Now, even as you prepare to maybe start your ministry, start an organization, start your own small business, whatever you're planning to do, or even work under an organization, have certain values that you will follow. You know, okay, this is what I will do. 40 hours a week is what I must give in. I will give in that. Right? And then there will be times I'll have to uh, give in those extra hours, but I'll do it faithfully. The values. So some of our core values at ABC. One, integrity. We value integrity over profit. Uh, uh, so we very, very important. We refuse to make profit while sacrificing integrity. Right. So it's not about, uh, you know, yes, we want to, you know, as a church, we want to, you know, touch many lives, go uh, impact the entire nation and the nations, but we don't want to do it in a way that is, um, you know, without integrity. Right? Follow integrity, follow uh, uh, right uh, way of doing things. Then excellence, passion for excellence, to keep doing uh, the best in what we are doing. People, now we value people over policies. We don't treat, uh, you know, people with partiality. You know, as a church, we have people from different backgrounds, uh, different, uh, you know, uh, uh, religious backgrounds, different uh, ethnic backgrounds, different cultures, different languages, right? So different kinds of people. Now, we treat everyone equally. And that's something that we value. Right? It's not about, you know, what you can do for the church, how much can you give to the church, or are you uh, willing to volunteer in the church now? It can be somebody who's just maybe two months in the church. They're new to church, right? Uh, just value them, just like you would value anybody else. You know, uh, I remember, you know, just a couple of months back, there was this uh, auntie in church at, uh, in our location. And every week I would see her. She would come, she would sit as a... Uh, you know, as a family, they would come and uh, every every after every Sunday after the church, she would immediately leave. Right. So one week, I went and spoke to her. I said, uh, uh, "You know, uh, Adi, why why do you leave immediately? Stay back, fellowship with one another." So she mentioned to me, "You know, uh, I I don't speak too good English. I can speak a regional language, which is Canada, and uh, I'm more." You know, I'm more uh, comfortable speaking Kannada, but I understand English, so that's why I, I come and I enjoy the sermons. I enjoy everything that, that's being taught here. Uh, but it's just that I'm not able to fellowship much because people may think, okay, they feel embarrassed or to talk in Kannada. And I remember telling her, oh, we, you know, I, I, I started speaking to her in Kannada, and she was so happy. I, of course, my uh, Kannada was a little broken, but. What happened was she felt so much valued and she said, wow, uh, you know, you're talking to me in Canada, even though it's then every time I meet her, I talk to her in Canada. It's not, it's not like, okay, you learn English. No, because we value people more than our policy. We are an English church, but the people is what we value. Right? And so we don't say, okay, you're speaking this language. So, you know, nothing. Right? All of them are equal in the eyes of God. We all stand on level ground, right? Then creativity. We pursue creativity in everything without getting blinded by the routine. So, so in every area, in media, in graphics, in our preaching, in our teaching, in our in everything, we want to pursue creativity. We, we in our programs, in our events, uh, just trying new things. You know, over the years, we've tried many new things. Some have worked, some have didn't work. Didn't work. Uh, but we try to, you know, just the ones that work, we try and continue to build on them. The ones that didn't work, we just go back, see 
what what happened, how it didn't work, and how we can improve. Just being creative, and most importantly, unity. Uh, what we accomplish is not accomplished by one person, but it is always accomplished as a team. Right. So in APC, one of the things, very important aspects of uh, APC in, in our leadership is we always, always, you know, want to form teams, grow teams, build teams, right? So it's never one person, right? We, we need teams, right? And looking at what we have uh, on a Sunday basis, we need teams. If we don't have teams, we will burn out. So we have the ushering team, we have the book table team, we have the member care team, uh, uh, the greeters team, the sound and setup team, the media team, right? Uh, the FTV uh, first time visitors team, right? So we have so many teams. Now, as if there was one person, how will this one person do all of this? It's not possible. Right. Uh, we have a children's church teams and in children's church, we have smaller teams to help with you know, uh, different age groups. So teams. So as a church, we are united. Right. We may have five locations, north, south, east, west and central, uh, but we all work together as a team. We never look at ourselves as, OK, you are in this location, you are in that location. No, we are all one team. The vision is the same, the mission is the same, the values are the same. One team. Right? Uh, it's just that we have different locations. And the reason we have different locations is so that uh, we can reach out to more people in different uh, parts of the city. Right. So these are some of our core values. And there are many more, uh, you know, Christ likeness, uh, you know, uh, honesty, uh, simplicity. These are things that we uh, want to pursue uh, and as core values. Next point, create a culture aligned to your vision and mission. Right? Uh, Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 20. So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build, but you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. Now, this was wonderful what Nehemiah did. Right? Now, just a little bit of background. We'll touch on this, and then uh, we'll talk about three powerful values next uh, on Wednesday. But let me just touch on this, right? The city of Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians, 587 BC. Uh, now, about 445 BC, Nehemiah was there in the Persian, uh, in the court of the Persian king, and his job was he was a cupbearer, right? So he was working in the palace. Uh, you know, serving drinks to the guests, serving drinks to the king. Now, what happened? There was, he heard that the gates have been burned down and the walls of Jerusalem are broken. Right? Now, this is a big task, big vision. But it was a vision that was burning inside. I can only, you know, I like what Nehemiah does the Bible says that he went and he fasted and he prayed. Very, very important thing. You know, sometimes we have a vision, we write it down, and we do everything else, all the practical things, which is very important. But here, what did Nehemiah do? He went, he fasted and prayed, put on sackcloth and ashes. He fasted and prayed, and he said, God, the walls are down. Your city, and the gates have been burned down, the walls have crumbled down. But that vision was burning. And because he fasted and prayed, he went to the king, he obtained you know, permission, and the king was favorable to Nehemiah. Right? Now, one man, big vision, right? And he could not do this alone. Right now, first was the burning vision was there inside. He did something about it. He fasted, he prayed. God's favor was upon him. He said, okay, king said, go. You can go and build the wall. I'll do what, what I can do. I'll, here, here are some people. Here is some uh, material that you need. Here are the papers. Go start your work. 
am i as alone now first thing how do i get the people to believe what i am doing to, to catch this vision now, the vision is burning in my heart but they should believe it no i can't do it alone so what did he do first thing vision nehemiah shared the vision with the people of jerusalem he shared how god has led them this far giving them favor and support from the persian king now the vision was compelling people were inspired to join the vision you, you, imagine this nehemiah is standing there in front of the people of jerusalem they are doing their work they are not bothered about jerusalem the gates are burned down the walls are burned. it doesn't matter to them but the vision is burning in nehemiah's house and nehemiah goes and says okay people of jerusalem whoever is here maybe there were very few people so here's the vision here's what i've uh, i've done i've gone spoken to the king said king the walls of jerusalem are broken down the gates are burned down now i got permission from the king to rebuild the wall and to fix up the border the, the walls of jerusalem oh the king gave you permission to do this yes okay and sounds good i'll join you right so the vision was compelling right people were inspired to join second one the mission now nehemiah was a cup bearer he was not an engineer in any way right he he was not a craftsman he was he didn't he was not trained in uh, you know building houses or nothing but nehemiah planned out how to construct reconstruct this wall so the work was divided to the 10 gates of the city of jerusalem now he said okay some of you are here you've joined the vision okay you now here's what we're going to do the mission is we we'll, this wall has 10 gates we'll have groups of people in each 10 gates and we'll have team leaders on each of these 10 so all these 10 team leaders will come and let me know what's happening at their gates right so there's this section section one section two section three 10 sections and each of those 10 sections has leaders under those leaders you have people so um, everyone get involved in the work right so each one of them would work now this is all over time okay this is not uh, uh, you know during their uh, during their work hours because they had to work to feed them feed themselves to feed their families so they worked and during their free time when they had time they would go to the closest gate from their house so they were from in gate 2 they would go there begin to do some work this is during the free time why because the vision was compelling so maybe they got home, oh man, a nine to five job, I'm tired, I want to rest. Oh, Nehemiah said we have to, you know, whichever is, which part is closest to us, we have to start rebuilding the wall. He says, okay, instead of resting, I'll go. I'll do my part, maybe two hours. I'll, I'm just painting a picture for you, right? I'll go two hours, build something, just do something there, and then I can come back home and rest, right? So the mission was well, the vision was burning so people joined that mission right third one values uh first everyone believed that the god of heaven will prosper them i can just picture nehemiah saying nehemiah saying you know god is with us don't worry we may not be skilled but god can give us the wisdom god is on our side uh, no matter what happens uh, no matter what uh, opposition comes god is on our side so everyone believed that they had to do their part so nehemiah said to everyone you have to do your part you everyone and even nehemiah put his hand, he's not standing there with folded hands saying okay you do this you do this no. he put his hand to the plow he put his hand to the work right uh, everyone believed that they had to do their part thirdly they knew that opposition will come, but everyone was was determined that nothing will stop them. All of them had the same mindset, uh, and and then 
because of these three powerful beliefs, right, they were able to complete building the wall. First one, God is on our side. We will all work. All of us will put a hand to the plow. And three, nothing can stop us. Three powerful values. We'll come back uh, tomorrow, uh, sorry, on Wednesday, and we'll continue from here. Uh, what I'd encourage you is uh, just go ahead and read this portion of Nehemiah where you know uh, he gets this whole vision. Just read it uh, so that when we meet on Wednesday, uh, it'll give us a good background as to how uh, God just put this vision and he was able to fulfill it, uh, fulfill building the walls of Jerusalem. Right? All right. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, have a great week ahead, and I'll see you on Wednesday. Uh, God bless. Thank you.